Aloha. My name is Melissa Lamerson from FMA Chapter 19 in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I am so honored to be able to share with you some key concepts about organizational culture and how leveraging some key parts of your culture can lead to improved performance. I have worked extensively with individuals and teams over the last 15 years to improve performance. In my former life, I led a cultural transformation initiative for Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. If there is one takeaway that I can share through my experience of leading change in a large organization, it's that people, more than business plans or physical assets, are really what makes a strong company. I've learned that leveraging by deliberate design a company culture, an organization has an opportunity that goes far beyond what they can imagine. Today we're going to describe what organizational culture is and examine the three levels of a culture. We'll define generic subcultures that hinder success of an organization and discover how culture and strategy relate. Lastly, we'll evaluate some key takeaways from a case study in organizational culture change. But before we get started today, let's examine this story. A group of scientists placed five monkeys in a cage and in the middle a ladder with bananas on top. Every time a monkey went up the ladder, the scientists soaked the rest of the monkeys with cold water. After a while, every time a monkey went up the ladder, the others beat up the one on the ladder. After some time, no monkey dare go up the ladder, regardless of the temptation. Scientists then decided to substitute one of the monkeys. The first thing this new monkey did was go up the ladder. Immediately, the other monkeys beat him up. After several beatings, the new member learned not to climb the ladder, even though he never knew why. A second monkey was substituted, and the same occurred. The first monkey participated on the beating for the second monkey. The replacements repeated until what was left was a group of five monkeys that, even though never received a cold shower, continued to beat up any monkey who attempted to climb the ladder. If you ask the new group of monkeys why the beatings took place, the answer would probably be, Well, I don't know. That's just how things are done around here. This story illustrates the power of organizational culture. Like monkeys, over time, organizational groups collect and maintain habits, attitudes, and rules that define and direct their members. People uphold and guard these practices in order to reach goals, gain acceptance, and fit in, often without stopping to question their origins. This is how an organizational culture develops and perpetuates. Perhaps your organization's culture is well-designed and intentional. However, if you discover you're doing something you don't understand, stop to question assumptions to better understand why things are done. So why does culture matter? The average American will spend one third of their life at work. The environment in which they spend that time will largely dictate the quality of our employees' professional life. If they work for a company with a strong culture that aligns with their own beliefs and attitudes, they'll be more likely to work hard and remain with that company for a long time. If, on the other hand, the company's culture does not reflect their own personal viewpoints, they're much more likely to leave, or worse, remain with the company but underperform. You see, at its best, the culture can be an asset that enables, energizes, and enhances human behavior. And when wisely applied, it can accelerate and sustain our business results. But at its worst, culture can be a drag on productivity and emotional commitment. It can lead to underperformance and undermine our long-term success. The interesting thing about culture is that it develops whether intended, unintended, actively directed, or left to chance. An organization's culture can be deliberately steered and influenced to either enhance the impact it has on performance 
or reduce the resistance it can have on behavioral change. If culture is not created deliberately, it will default to whoever has the loudest voice in the room and will have a tendency to become unstable due to future change in leadership, personalities, or organization goals. So let's begin by exploring what organizational culture is not. It is not the fringe benefits, like at Google, Amazon, Facebook, with cafeterias, nap rooms, and ball pits. It is not employee engagement. While employee engagement is a visible artifact of a healthy culture, it is not culture as a whole. We sometimes confuse the ability to value diversity as identifying what organizational culture is, but this is not what we're talking about today. Morale, or quality of life, whether positive or negative, is not organizational culture. However, morale is sometimes confused with command climate, which we'll talk more about. So what's the difference between organizational culture and organizational climate? Organizational culture is often used in conjunction with command climate in our military organizations. And many people tend to use terms synonymously. For example, we say it's important for leaders to promote a culture and climate of trust, but culture and climate are not the same. Climate is a frontman, the crowd stealer, the glitzy, showy buzzword that gets all of the attention, while organizational culture is the man behind the curtain, the shadow operator who calls the shots but is never seen nor heard. Culture shapes organizational thinking, feelings, and behavior, much like personality shapes the actions of individuals. However, many leaders rarely recognize or acknowledge the influence of organizational culture when making decisions and solving problems. Leaders are challenged with differentiating between culture and climate in today's workforce. Here's an easy way to distinguish between the two concepts. Culture explains what we do, the norms that define acceptable behavior in the organization and why we do it, the outcomes we value for the organization. Together, the what and why, the norms and values, form the shared beliefs of the culture. On the other hand, climate is much more precarious than culture. It's very important. It focuses on how we feel as we carry out those actions. Organizational culture and climate have an interdependent relationship. Effective leaders use climate as a tool to sustain, strengthen, and or modify the shared beliefs that form an organization's culture. Leaders shape the climate both intentionally and unintentionally through their personal conduct. This can range from direct actions such as role modeling, expected behavior, to indirect actions such as formal statements and policy decisions. Ideally, leaders create a supportive command climate, one that fosters mutual trust and psychological safety to enhance the organization's ability to solve problems and manage internal anxiety. Leaders who sacrifice a supportive climate for short-term success run the risk of creating patterns of behaviors, or culture, which manifest into shared beliefs that stifle innovation, adaptive thinking, and self-direction. Balancing short-term success with long-term improvement is a constant challenge leaders face as they juggle mission requirements with the developmental needs of the organization. Conversely, culture also influences the climate. Norms and values within a stable organizational culture establish limits for acceptable behavior within groups. When members operate within existing norms, their actions foster a stable command climate. When a member's actions fall outside of the acceptable norms of conduct, 
their behavior disrupts the emotional stability of the organization and creates an unsettled command climate. So what is organizational culture? Organizational culture is the accepted behaviors, social norms, working language, systems, symbols, beliefs, and habits of the organizations that are influenced by social interaction. Organizational culture can be, be described as how we do things around here. It's important to know that while an organization has a culture, it also has a subculture as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in future slides. So how is organizational culture developed? Culture is a pattern of shared basic assumptions invented, discovered, or developed by a group as it learns to cope with its problems of external adaptation and internal integration that has worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore must be taught to new members of the group as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to those problems. So culture is a process of sense making in organization. A crucial purpose of culture is to help orient its members to reality in ways that provide a basis for alignment of purpose and shared action. Like the monkeys in the cage, we often make assumptions based on our experiences solving problems. These experiences are usually shared through stories to our coworkers and friends and over time can influence the culture. When enough people in the organization have had the same experience or believe in the same outcome, a culture is born. Edgar Schein has defined three levels of organizational culture artifacts, espoused values, and basic underlying assumptions. These levels of a culture can be thought of like an iceberg. A small portion above the waterline, very visible, while a large portion of the culture below the waterline is invisible and deep. He suggests that assumptions of an organization's culture can be observed through artifacts. The first level of a culture, artifacts, are the tangible aspects of an organization's culture. They can be seen, heard, felt, and witnessed very easily. Items such as building infrastructure, layout of workspaces, dress and appearance, professional language, stories and jargon, rituals and ceremonies, reward, punishment, these are all examples of artifacts. However, even though this level of culture is easy to observe, it's also very hard to decipher and understand. Espouse values are the second level of culture. Unlike artifacts, these espouse values cannot typically be observed. These values are conscious, but are not usually at the forefront of people's minds. These espouse values or norms are closely associated with the unwritten rules that allow members of a culture to know what is expected of them in a wide variety of situations. At the deepest level of a culture, members hold values and conform to norms because of their underlying assumptions. These assumptions nurture and support the norms. The norms and values, in turn, encourage activities that produce surface-level artifacts. For example, an organization may have an underlying assumption that people are bad. This assumption would lead to a norm that members don't leave the office building without permission. An artifact of this underlying assumption might be a sign-out board in, which, in each cubicle that requires workers to state their location, contact phone number, and expected return. Unless you dig down into the deepest level of the basic assumptions, the artifacts, espoused values, and norms cannot be properly deciphered. Basic assumptions 
are solutions for problems that have become so commonplace that they are taken for granted and rarely, if ever, questioned or examined. The basic assumptions within an organization are so deeply rooted and therefore are typically never debated or confronted, which makes any hint at changing them deeply frustrating and stressful for members of the organization. Since changing these assumptions requires great anxiety, organizations will tend to want to perceive events around us as congruent with our assumptions, even if that means distorting, denying, projecting, or in other ways falsifying to ourselves what may be going on around us. This creates a catastrophic dilemma as basic assumptions are the most important aspect of the organization's culture, the primary driver of decisions, and the most influential factor in determining what actions to take to reach the organization's goals. Big or small, all organizations have basic assumptions that are in need of understanding. Much of what goes on in an organization that has existed for some time can best be understood as a set of interactions of subcultures operating within the larger context of the organization. These subcultures share many of the assumptions of the total organization, usually reflecting their functional tasks, the occupations of their members, or their unique experiences. Shared assumptions that create subcultures most often form around functional units of the organization. They are often based on the similarity of background in members, a shared task, or similar organizational experience. We sometimes call these stovepipes or, si or silos. Subcultures are what di distinguishes cultural norms in HR from accounting. How many of you have ever had the difficult experience of bringing cross-functional teams together to work on a project? If you're like me, you've probably observed the difficulty in communications, trouble reaching consensus, and delays in implementing decisions to accomplish a task. In every organization, three generic subcultures are identified and must be managed to minimize destructive conflict. Conflicts between these different functions or departments are often misdiagnosed as political interdepartmental fights, power plays, or personality conflicts. However, what can be missed in that perception is that the different groups may have evolved in different subcultures, and the contributions of each of these subcultures are needed for organizational success. The issues that typically arise when these subcultures work together are often attributed to disagreement, clashing personalities, and often fail to notice the deeper shared assumptions that color how each function thinks. One of the critical functions of leadership is to ensure that these subcultures are aligned towards shared organizational goals. As we dive into the different subcultures within an organization in the upcoming slides, Keep in mind that new methodologies should consider the subcultures that already exist as changes are being introduced. This will help improve the uptake of new learning and ease the process of applying new learning to an already established subculture. So let's dive in. The operational subculture is a culture of day-to-day -day workers and line managers, the people who get products and services out procure supplies, process bills, and make delivery trucks run on time. The operations culture is grounded in an ingrained awareness of the way that quality of life depends on the capability and reliability of good people. The ability for the organization to meet its mission depends on operational people's knowledge, skill, learning ability, and commitment. Success in this subculture requires knowledge acquired locally and is based on organization core technology and specific experience. They develop an easy skepticism about overarching solutions, 
and know that technology generally doesn't work unless people are around to compensate for the flaws and bugs in design. And although many operations managers appreciate the importance of raising capital, there's no gut feel for finance built into the operational culture. Therefore, no matter how carefully engineered the production process is, or how carefully rules and routines are specified, frontline employees know that they will have to deal with unpredictable contingencies. They appreciate teams and understand, as nobody else does, how to get a bunch of disparate individuals to pull together. Most operations involve interdependencies between separate elements of the process. So they must be able to work as a collaborative team in which communication, openness, mutual trust, and commitment are highly valued. Leaders in this culture are often connoisseurs of human character. They expect good people to be loyal, candid, and trustworthy, and they do their best to shut out those who do not fit in. Workers in this subculture depend on management to provide the proper resources, training, and support to get their jobs done. The values of this subculture are people, learning, experience, dealing with the unpredictable, collaboration, and trust. The engineering subculture is personified by engineers and technical specialists, particularly in information technology and process engineering. They are stimulated by puzzles and problems and by the design challenge of creating an ideal world of elegant machines that operate in harmony. The one thing they're impatient with is other people. This culture is preoccupied with designing humans out of the systems rather than into them. Therefore, according to the categorization of this subculture, the ideal world is one of elegant machines and processes working in perfect precision and harmony without human intervention. Why, you ask? Because people are the problem. They make mistakes and should be designed out of the system wherever possible. Solutions must be based on science and available technology and not on gut feel. Real work is to solve puzzles and overcome problems. Work must be oriented towards useful products and outcomes. The values of this subculture is problem solving using abstract solutions to reach perfect precision and harmony. The last and final subculture is the executive subculture. Members of this culture typically include the CEO, the board, the business unit leaders, and the finance oriented. Although they may support learning and human potential, their jobs and passions lie in overseeing the cash flow that keeps the organization alive. They are the only ones directly accountable for the organization's obligation to return money and value to outsiders, both to shareholders and to society at large. They tend to see themselves as lone heroes, embattled and competitive. They are the last recourse in a crisis. They believe that without financial survival and growth, there are no returns to shareholders or society. This focus on the financial keeps them at perpetual war with competitors. And in a war, you can't trust anyone. As a lone hero, they remain in total control and believe that they are indispensable because subordinates only tell you what they think you want to hear. Executives must trust their own judgment more and more. The lack of accurate feedback increases the leader's sense of rightness. In this subculture, the organization and management are intrinsically hierarchical. This hierarchy is a measure of success in the subculture and is a primary means to maintain control. They believe that people are a necessary evil to be acquired and managed, A well-oiled organ organization does not need whole people, only activity that they are contracted for. The values of this subculture are survival, control, hierarchy, 
and keeping shareholders happy. So why does this all matter anyway? Such dramatic change in organizational survival and effectiveness is understandable when considering the shift from an industrial age economy to a concept age economy. This shift away from an industrialization towards information is also illustrated by the fact that more information has been produced in the last 20 years than was produced in the previous 5,000 years. At a glance of your social media news feed, you're likely to come across more information than in a lifetime during the 20th century. Think about it. The total amount of information available to the average person doubles every five years, which means that the rate of technological change associated with this information explosion has created an environment intolerant of the status quo. Case in point, your new iPhone 12 is 967 times more powerful than IBM's 1998 Deep Blue chess computer. And 898 million times more powerful than the Apollo 11 guidance computer. Isn't that amazing? This rapid and dramatic changes in our environment implies that no organization can remain the same for long and survive. The current challenge, therefore, is not to determine whether or not to change, but how to change in order to increase organizational effectiveness. Let's take a look at the age-old saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast, and how culture can help or hinder your organizational strategies that lead to business performance. There's a famous quote allegedly attributed to Peter Drucker that culture eats strategy for breakfast, or something like that. It implies you can set whatever course for your business you want, but it will be your culture, what your people believe and how they behave, that determines what will get lived out in the work. Culture isn't inherently about workspaces and perks like comfy chairs and ping pong tables. It's about the habits that people have formed, how they make decisions and how they respond to challenges, pressure and discomfort, and what they believe is good or bad for success based on what's been incented, rewarded, reinforced, and possibly even punished in their workplace. Culture is what you have when the majority in your workforce act out the same set of beliefs even if they're not the traits that are codified by your company. And for precisely that reason, culture can be a powerful force in an organization, for better or worse. As a result, there's an ongoing debate about which is truly more important to deal with in a company trying to change its direction, the strategy or the culture. This culture eats strategy maxim warns of culture interfering with or contradicting strategy, which it certainly can. But we must remember successful strategies enable business solvency, which enables an organizational culture of some kind to exist at all. In fact, you might say that in ideal situations, culture and strategy nurture each other in an ongoing cycle. Whether it remains a healthy cycle depends. But let's just start by saying you get into the cycle by the business being relatively successful for some minimum amount of time. How long that success or solvency continues is one of the primary factors that allows cultural behaviors and traditions to become ingrained, and those habits are what can potentially lead to problems with new strategy sometime down the road. So, in an existing business desiring to change direction, how do we reconcile culture and strategy? Can you just do the right strategic work, focusing on the right business goals in order to end up with the right culture or a new culture? Or do you have to start by addressing the culture to make sure it allows the right business actions, decisions, and work to get done? I've seen advice offered both ways. Many people advocate that if you just get the strategy correct and execute on it effectively, that the right behaviors can't help but follow, resulting over time in the right culture. This reasoning goes, even if you don't have the desired culture, you can get it as a side effect of just getting your core business right. And again, this perspective is correct in that success makes having a culture possible. It's what sustains culture and allows it to survive. Others take the opposite approach. They advise focusing on culture first to make sure it enables and doesn't impede your new strategy. In fact, some would say culture is the actual enabler of the execution on any kind of strategy, that strategy is lived out through the behaviors and actions, since that is what culture most often influences. So this perspective is also correct in that culture does matter, often significantly. At the same time, each side also has a valid critique of the other. Exclusively focusing on culture can't be the end game. The business strategy and executing on it is understandably the primary objective. 
Obviously, a company culture can't exist if the company goes out of business, so good strategy is clearly important. But if culture becomes a powerful enough influence on the motivations of the workforce, the culture can actually negatively impact an organization to the point of jeopardizing its solvency and its future. And that's certainly worthy of being addressed seriously as well. So, what's the key to balancing these? I think it's about discovering the organizational landscape, figuring out first if the existing culture in your business is going to readily enable your strategy or not. Investigate what culture you really have, remembering that who people are and what they truly believe are most revealed when uncomfortable or under pressure. That honest analysis and evaluation is what will give you a clue if your culture will chew up and spit out your strategy. And to that end, this is ultimately the linchpin question to ask yourself about your culture. Can the culture be sustained by anything other than the successful execution of the strategy? In other words, will behaviors either be actively or passively permitted and rewarded for activity other than execution of the strategy? If the answer is yes, you're going to have a situation where culture can ignore or destroy strategy because it can be sustained and emboldened by something else. You're going to have a climate for the behaviors of your workforce to conflict with or at least not contribute to achieving your strategy. To put it bluntly, if your culture can be fat and happy without needing to do that new thing, it's not going to do it. Now, I know that makes culture sound rather juvenile, but generally individuals in the workforce are not trying to be. They often just don't understand how to behave differently. They don't know what it feels like to live in a different culture. So let's consider how such a gap between culture and strategy can be reconciled. My favorite metaphor to explain how culture and strategy function together comes from Tanner Bechtel. He says, Strategy, in my perspective, is our journey. It's what we aspire and conspire to complete. It's a conscious choice in direction. Culture is the landscape. A mile on pavement takes much less work, gear, and preparation than a mile through a mountain pass. The terrain, culture must be considered when planning our journey, strategy. And the realistic perspective must be applied when planning. We wouldn't want to take off across the Andes in tennis shoes and shorts. By understanding the terrain, we can intelligently plan a successful journey. Now at this point, some of you may say, yeah, I see it, and I understand why I need to address it. But others of you may say, I'll consider my culture, but not too much, really. I don't want to have to address my culture because, honestly, It's serving me well. I like it the way it is. Hmm. Well, so long as you don't like it more than staying in business, this is indeed another common question worthy of confronting. Can you change a strategy or execute on new strategies without shifting your culture? Sure, if your culture isn't the primary thing holding you back. If it's a culture that enables your strategy and execution work. If it's a terrain suitable for such a journey, to borrow from Bechtel. So ultimately, resolving the strategy versus culture dilemma is about doing the hard work to figure out if the terrain that exists will either enable or prevent the right behaviors. You need to map your terrain, your culture. Find out what actually drives behaviors that lead to decisions and actions in your company. And if you discover the wrong behaviors in your culture, like the first step in any 12-step program, you have to own it. Admit it as current state, and then ask yourself, what's sustaining it? From what are those ways of behaving being propped up? What allows them to live on? And if that's your real issue, perhaps it's time to confront your culture, to make sure your workforce is schooled, incented, fed, and rewarded by the progress toward and achievement of your strategy. And that, in turn, will begin to provide additional nutrition and momentum for your strategic journey ahead. Confronting people's beliefs and behaviors may be painful, but in the end, old habits being broken and retrained will prevent your shiny new strategy from being chewed up and spit out. And that, in turn, will allow the opportunity for the new and healthy culture you need. You may be asking yourself at this point if this is real and if this is possible in a complex government organization to transform organizational culture. The answer is yes, absolutely, totally doable. Let's take a look at this case study in the Department of Defense at Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard and IMF. 
The organizational cultural transformation at this company spanned over the course of several years and is still ongoing. Pearl Harbor wanted to address the problem of having repeat problems over critical issues that were never resolved. There was no learning taking place. There was a lack of problem solving at all levels of the command, and they were not routinely meeting mission requirements. They took on the initiative to transform the learning, the organizational culture into a learning organization. This involved enabling learning at all levels of the command and empowering their people. As a result, they saw improvement in problem solving, visible learning, the ability to meet mission requirements, ownership at all levels of the command, and organizational pride. What made this transformation so unique were the people involved in the efforts. Like ripples made by a stone thrown into a pond, the impact and actions of a few leaders spread throughout the organization, sparked commitment and passion into the effort. Let's take a look at the key initiatives and learning that took place as this organization began its journey into transforming its organizational culture to improve its performance. Let's take a look at the organizational snapshot of Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard in 2006. The shipyard had reached a tipping point. It had recently been audited and was struggling with the ability to meet customer demands while remaining a viable asset for the nation. The customer or the fleet was very unhappy. There was a lot of delayed missions due to inefficiency and cost overruns. Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard was the worst performing shipyard in the country. Technology wasn't utilized to the fullest and did not enable learning or improvement. There was a lot of apathy, poor teamwork, lack of organizational pride at all levels of the organization, and they were not fully engaged in improving. People were looked at as an asset. However, they were not empowered to reach, help the organization reach the strategy or actively seek ways to improve. The mindset was compliance-driven, focus on mission only, and the lack and lack the vision for the future. The deeply ingrained culture of compliance, risk aversion, and focus on mission had set the conditions for a burning platform, ignited by an auditing organization with lots of authority. The need for change was apparent and necessary. Early in the journey, the shipyard chose to adopt a top-down and bottom-up change strategy. This would help in obtaining support from the executives or department heads, empower change agents from within the organization, and engender ownership of change at all levels of the organization. This method was selected to empower middle managers or leaders to affect change without significant senior manager management involvement, a critical deficiency outlined in audit findings. The John Cotter eight-step change management model was selected as a way to engage cultural transformation because it was the most conducive to engaging the top-down and bottom-up strategy while developing an oversight team that would be dedicated to the project. This involved creating a sense of urgency, building a guiding coalition, forming a strategic vision and initiatives, enlisting a volunteer army, enabling action by removing barriers, generating short-term wins, sustained acceleration, and instituting change. Change management initiatives take time and require sponsors to remove roadblocks that impede performance. This organization was lucky and the right conditions were set to allow the cultural transformation to succeed. Not only were the executives or department heads responsible to remove barriers and buy into the transformation effort, but headquarters personnel got involved and provided an umbrella of protection for the shipyard by asking customers or the fleet to not put additional pressures or schedule pressure 
on the shipyard to enable them to focus on improvement. This set the condition for success and helped to alleviate backsliding into undesirable behaviors. Passion and energy is easily dissipated in the face of demand created by a busy work schedule. To enable progress in the transformation effort, a small team of middle managers created the Learning Organization Steering Group, or LOSG. The LOSG membership consisted of a diverse group of about 20 people, managers, supervisors, and workers, who had a passion for learning organization concepts and had committed themselves to becoming subject matter experts while leading the cultural change. This group would be responsible for overseeing the cultural transformation over the next several years. It is important to note that the steering group or a guiding coalition must have the authority to shape, implement, and sustain the efforts needed for cultural transformation to succeed. While the shipyard was grounded in their current reality and excited to start on their cultural transformation, they knew that they could not blindly move forward without articulating where they wanted to go. Instead of just saying, we want a learning culture, they decided to articulate a list of behaviors they would observe if they were successful. These, this list of behaviors was articulated into yearly goals that could be translated into action by all levels of the organization. Today, this practice is still sustained and articulates to everyone in the organization where it is they want to go and what the behaviors in the new culture will look like if they are successful. But you get what you measure. In complex, busy organizations, the tendency to, distracted, to get distracted is inevitable. Aside from the vision, the organization needed a way to quantify progress. They went through a ser series of iterations and transformed over time into measuring just the progress towards the strategy for cultural change to measurements in areas of safety, quality, schedule, cost, and behavior and their role in transforming the organizational culture. At this point, I'll skip forward several years to share with you what we should have done to minimize learning and mistakes in the journey. Although the organizational culture assessment occurred at year six of the journey, the organization may have made more progress in a shorter amount of time if they had completed an in-depth organizational culture assessment baseline prior to starting any change initiatives. Nonetheless, Edgar Schein's organizational cultural model was used to assess the organizational culture in relation to the business problem of not being able to consistently meet mission requirements. This assessment required the randomization of people from various subcultures of the organization put into focus groups and brought through the process of identifying artifacts, espoused values, and the gap between espoused values and shared assumptions. On a team level, culture change occurs through shared experiences and learning that influences the shared basic assumptions of the organization. Through measurement instruments such as surveys and interactive team reflection sessions, behaviors that helped or hindered the desired culture were quantified through surveys and discussed through facilitated open and honest conversations to identify areas for improvement. This became a critical initiative for culture change because it was something that teams could initiate on their own with little help from outside members. The shared experience of team learning dialogue sessions became, began to transform the microcultures and subcultures within the organization. There was a lot of excitement and motivation by members of all levels of the organization because of the participative change model being used. 
For the first time in a long time, the mental models of the workforce were heard and valued. Middle managers did not waste time harnessing this excitement. The growth of the LOSG subgroup called PHLO, or Pearl Harbor Learning Organization, made, it motiv made up of young motivated apprentices, began educating their peers about cultural changes and disciplines of a learning organization. This was the first time in the history of initiatives that the workforce embraced change to this magnitude. Project teams began to model desired behaviors by engaging in new rituals and norms. In this picture, this project team plants a ceremonial plumeria tree in which they will nurture and care for during the duration of the project. This tree is an artifact or a symbol of their mutual agreement that they will take care of each other and not engage in old behaviors of yelling at each other. This was modeled after the local legend from the Solomon Islands about the yelling trees. The artifact is a visual reminder of the commitment to relationships and the culture that we desire. Learning cells were initiated as safe spaces for teams to explore issues or improvement using learning organization disciplines and various learning tools that encourage the reflection of various perspectives. These learning cells created shared spaces in which, in which the desired culture could be modeled and coached while serving internal and external problems. Critical actions in, in, in ensuring the desired organizational culture flourishes. Removing barriers at the right level is critical to ensuring the success of cultural transformation. Addressing critical subcultures of the organization is essential to translating the new culture to business outcomes. It was at this point of the journey that the communities of practice were formed. COPs were developed to create larger safe spaces for the desired culture change to occur. Shared experiences and problem solving to meet internal and external demands are necessary for a culture to take hold. Like learning cells, communities of practice are organized around work and are not spe specific to a problem or improvement area. The area of concern for a COP was to address the barriers between the critical subcultures of operators, engineering, and executive management. The misalignment in values and ineffective communications between these groups had resulted in conflicting messages, priorities, and a lack of empathy. Additionally, the COPs were great learning venues for learning, knowledge sharing, and efficiency to coexist. Communities of practices were staffed with full-time members that displayed the desired leadership behaviors and were given full autonomy within their community to take on initiatives that would improve performance and help the culture flourish. Another initiative that occurred while COPs were established was a methodology called productioneering. This addressed the subcultures in venues outside of the communities of practice. Facilitated dialogue sessions around the work through learning cells made sure to encourage the perspective sharing of each subculture. This created a deeper understanding of why and how work should be done while building relationships. It was expected that in order to set the conditions for collaboration to occur, the leadership from the top down must model the behaviors themselves because attitude reflects leadership, a key takeaway in the transformation journey. There were many initiatives along the journey, but a few stand out as leverage points. Early in the journey, it was necessary to rally the entire organization in understanding that everyone had a hand in the success of the organization. Everyone from production workers, engineering, finance, facilities from every level of the organization was incentivized to align their activities to specific organizational goals. This encouraged collaboration, systems thinking, and motivated the workforce to continue desired organizational behaviors. The organization, the organization celebrated with time off awards for everyone in the organization. This ranged from four hours 
and progressively increased to four hour, to eight hours as the organization was able to meet larger milestones aligned with the mission. This was truly unheard of at the time and created a lot of buzz and excitement in the shipyard. Communities of practice and team-based learning cells led to the realization that meeting the needs of their members in order to encourage personal mastery and self-improvement was a necessity. This motivated teams to work hard to change the way they listened and learned in order to ensure all members felt valued. While not, while not extrinsically motivated, this recognition allowed team members to feel valued and heard. COPs were able to champion initiatives that met lower level needs of their members prior to focusing on more complex initiatives. This brings us to how we accelerated change. To accelerate change at an individual level to meet the organizational goals and strategies, modeling desired behaviors was essential. A workshop for senior and middle level managers was created. The Personal Mastery Executive Workshop served as an alignment and coaching initiative to the desired organizational culture and goals. It set the standard for the accepted norms, working language, and structure to be modeled and championed by leaders. Each group within the workshops were carefully assembled to reflect subcultures and communities that would enable individual and organizational success. As leadership is a key enabler of culture, this initiative was essential to propel the transformation. To accelerate the change transformation, the organization realized that reinforcing desired behaviors was not enough to ensure success. To create the conditions for change to become successful, they deliberately changed the structure of many facets of the business. This made it readily apparent that things were to be done differently. The saying, change structure, change behavior, became a mantra that facilitated change everywhere in the organization. The focus on accountability through every facet of the organization also helped to create alignment and ownership of the transformation. These initiatives span from individuals, teams, departments, and functional areas through formal and informal self-assessment initiatives. It encouraged open and honest dialogue, collaboration, and knowledge sharing or coaching when needed. The first step in change is to own it. In order to ensure changes in the culture were institutionalized, any and all learning from incentives were anchored into the organizational hierarchy. This meant promoting the ownership of concepts into various areas of the organization. This was done through various knowledge sharing methods, through codification into manuals, videos, information knowledge, informal knowledge sharing events, and policy changes. Many initiatives led to complete changes in programs and organizational structure. There are a few key takeaways that I would like. Lou Gertzner said, culture isn't just one aspect of the game, it is the game. In the end, an organization is nothing more than the collective capacity of its people to create value. Culture change is difficult, even under normal circumstances. Throwing COVID-19 and remote work, and it's easy to let culture fall by the wayside. But these challenges needn't derail your efforts. By understanding how organizational culture is developed, and the key takeaways from the case studies we reviewed, you'll have a significant competitive advantage and be well on your way to promoting excellence in government service. And perhaps most importantly, you'll be investing in what's most critical to success, your people. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. It's been an honor and a privilege to share my knowledge on organizational culture change with you all today. If you have any questions or would like more details on the journey, please contact me at the email 
on the slide. Mahalo and aloha.